You are listening to the Apex Hour, hosted by Ryan Paul on KSUU Thunder 91.1. This show allows more personal time with our guests, allowing them to give us their stories and opinions. We will also give you new music to listen to, hoping you enjoy some new sounds and genres. Welcome to this episode of the Apex Hour. Hello, everyone, and welcome into the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. This week, we are joined in the studio by Ryan Paul, the director of Apex, and our phenomenal guest speaker, Megan Kate Nelson. For those of you who were unable to attend our event or who would just like a little follow up, this radio hour is the place for you. Ryan, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Amelia. We are so excited to have Dr. Megan Kate Nelson here with us in the studio today. Just in case you don't know who she is, she is brilliant, first of all, uh, an expert on the American Civil War, on the U.S. West, popular culture. She's written uh, articles for the New York Times, Time Magazine, The Atlantic, Smithsonian, uh, the Civil War Times. She's a regular contributor to a variety of, of journals and websites and podcasts and all kinds of cool, fun stuff. Uh, she is the author of four books. Uh, her most recent, Saving Yellowstone, is what we'll talk about today more specifically. But her th- the book before that, there's some other word for that, uh, the, the Three-Cornered War was a finalist for the 2020 Pulitzer Prize in history. So we're happy and so glad. And this is the coolest thing of all. Two things. One, she is a cocktail enthusiast, which is super cool. And secondly, she is a, uh, a regular guest on Road Dog Radio on Sirius XM, the trucking channel. So, uh, you know, if, if uh, ready for the convoy. <laughs> right? As that goes. So she has taught. She taught at Texas Tech, at Harvard, at Cal State Fullerton. Uh, but now she is a regular author and writer. So thank you for being here. Well, thanks so much for having me, Ryan. This is great. So I want to start with the really the, the beginning of your book and a story that, that not a lot of people know about pre-Yellowstone, right? Before it's Yellowstone. And that has to do with a guy named Truman Everts. Can you tell his story? Yes. So I wanted to start the book with Truman Everts because his story is rather spectacular uh, and really was responsible for bringing Yellowstone into the American imagination right before Ferdinand Hayden led his 1871 scientific expedition there. Um, He was a tax assessor. He was a Montana civil official. And He was about to kind of leave his post and go back to the East Coast. And uh, Nathaniel Langford, who was another civil official in Montana Territory, kind of came up to him and said, hey, you want to go on this expedition? We're going to go check out Yellowstone. Um, These were not professionals. These were amateurs. They'd been in the West for a while, but they didn't really know what they were doing. And so they they put together a group. They got a a protective detail from the Army, and they went into Yellowstone um, in August of 1870. And they did okay for about two weeks. Um, And then right around Yellowstone Lake on the western side, Truman Everts kind of got mad. They had a fight about where they were going to go, and he kind of stomped off uh, into the forest uh, around there and got lost. As tax assessors are wont to do. I mean... The tax men are always like that, aren't they, yes, Ryan? They are. I mean, they're always charging off into the wilderness, getting themselves lost. Um, his fellow team members looked for him for about a week, uh, but he got kind of turned around and started going in the opposite direction. So he was in Yellowstone by himself for 37 days. And on the second day, his horse bolted. So all he had with him uh, were a kind of a spyglass. Uh, and a couple other odds and ends, like a small knife and something else. So he did not have a gun. He had no way to procure food for himself. Uh, and by the time he was found, 37 days later, he was skin and bones. Um, and this story was really spectacular. And it it kind of broke upon the world. They couldn't believe they had found him again, that he had survived this incredible trauma in the wilderness. And he came. he became a kind of Western celebrity. And I mean, like, doesn't his his glasses get broken or something? It's like that mm-hmm. Twilight Zone episode where the guy has a little time to read and his glasses break. So he's just wandering around, falling yeah. into pits and yes. hiding. And 
Yes, he accidentally, he, he goes to sleep in the middle of a snowstorm because he got caught out there in September, which if any of you have been to Yellowstone at that time of year, you know it will snow on you. Um, and if you get caught out in it, it can be very dangerous. And he was trying to get warm, and so he was sleeping near... <laughs> Uh, you know, kind of on part of the geyser basin um, near a hot spring, and he fell in. He kind of fell in on his hip and scalded himself. It's really a miracle that he survived, (laughs) really. And so he then tours the country, or tours the east at least, telling this story. Mm -hmm. And he wrote a big piece for Scribner's Monthly, which was a new popular magazine that had already published an account of Yellowstone by Nathaniel Langford, the leader. Um, And Langford had been giving lectures all over the East Coast, um, being paid by Jay Cook, an investment banker who was invested in the Northern Pacific Railroad, which he wanted to run right north of Yellowstone to bring tourists there. So um, all of this is happening kind of at this critical moment. And Americans are starting to learn about Yellowstone and what is there and, and how kind of alluring it is, but also how dangerous it is. Because it had been the source of like a fantasy novel, right? I mean, it mm-hmm. was like hell on earth and they'd have all these mm-hmm. weird descriptions by the trappers and the mountain men. Is that correct exactly yeah it was it was just a place that everyone passed along stories and rumors no one could really believe they were true because and i think it's hard for us to access it at this point because we know yellowstone we know it so well we've seen photographs um but in this moment when no one knew anything about this place and the stories coming out of it just seemed completely insane right like oh a mud volcano. Oh, a cliff made of glass. Oh, you know, holes in the ground where on a, you know, a regular basis, steaming water will just come jutting out in this giant fountain. It just seemed too incredible to believe. So Langford, who was the leader of this, the expedition, Everett tells his own story. Langford goes about paid for by Jay Cook, mm-hmm. who has an extreme financial interest in the railroad. Yep. Correct. Yep. And he wants to promote Yellowstone uh, he wants is he is he asking Langford to talk about this and popularize it so the government will act to preserve it or is he thinking something differently? He was just trying to at this point gin up uh, public enthusiasm for the railroad that maybe people would buy then shares in the railroad to help finance it and and start to kind of clamor for tourist access to the region. Um, So he had hired a bunch of lecturers who were kind of going around the country and promoting this region that in that period was known as the Great Northwest, kind of from the Great Lakes to basically the Rocky Mountains. And that was going to be the core corridor for the Northern Pacific. So uh, he wanted uh, Americans to be enthusiastic about it, but he was always lobbying Congress for some project or another. So it would have helped him immensely to have that government support. And, and as part of this Langford expedition, we have this kind of apocryphal story about the beginning of the mm-hmm. National Park idea. Would you share that with us? Yes. So after they returned, and, and historians don't really know when this story kind of emerged. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if Langford came up with it pretty quickly. He was a pretty canny operator, and he was a Montana booster. And the story that came out was that after they had lost Truman Everts and they would given up looking for him, they were on their way back, and they, had, they gathered together one night at Madison Junction. Uh, and around the campfire, they were talking about how remarkable a place Yellowstone was. Um, Because it really hit on all cylinders, right? They had already seen the canyon. They saw the waterfalls. They saw the wildlife. And then they had actually kind of gone through the upper and lower geyser basin and knew that it was was tremendous and, and unique. And so the story was that they sat around the fire talking about how all of these Montana businessmen were going to come in and make just a bundle on Yellowstone, that they were going to start charging people to come in. They were going to have hotels and spas and all sorts of things. And then one of the party, this is how the story went, just kind of said, you know what? We shouldn't do that. We should give it to the people. This should become a national park and belong to all Americans. No one should be trying to make a profit out of this place. And then in the story, all the other Montana guys are kind of like, okay, yeah, you're right. Right. So... This it became the origin story and actually was touted as such for years um, at Yellowstone National Park. They marked the site. It was in all the literature. Uh, and it really wasn't until the park historian, um, oh, why am I blanking on his name? 
one of the park historians uh, went to do some research on it and really started to dig in and, and really discovered that the story was not widely circulated until much, much later. <laughs> and so we're sort of like, did this really happen? We don't really think so. Um, and then the, uh, a letter turned up from one of Jay Cook's guys, one, his PR man, suggesting this idea of a national park uh, to Ferdinand Hayden. Um, in October of 1871. And, and that seemed like a more believable origin story, although not as kind of appealing, right? We like the, the story about people being selfless, you know, kind of initially going out and thinking, we're going to make a bunch of money on this. Oh, no, let's give it to the people. You yes. know, it's like the triumph of morality and the human spirit over greed uh, and... Instead of, you know, the truth, which was, in fact, greed. Yeah, yeah there you yeah. go. So we have this, this environment where Langford's giving talks, Everest is giving talks, it's becoming well known. And then we fast forward to not much later mm -hmm. that in the audience of one of these talks is Ferdinand Hayden. Yes. Right. And hears this and immediately changes his plans. So let's talk about that. Yes. So Ferdinand Hayden... Um, was a super interesting guy. He had grown up in poverty uh, in New England, child of divorce, super smart, very scrappy, ended up going to Oberlin and, and gaining this real interest in natural history. And so he had started um, going out in the field, collecting um, specimens, usually fossils, and selling them to scientists. And then he decided to hook up with all these government surveys. And so those were expeditions funded by the federal government to explore and map and explain and come to know landscapes all over the United States, but, but mostly between the Pacific and the Mississippi River. And so he had become uh, the leader of a survey of his own, uh, the Survey of Nebraska by 1867. And it was in January of 1871 that he went to the, one of Nathaniel Langford's lectures. And, you know, Ferdinand Hayden was always like looking for the main chance. He was always looking for an opportunity to uh, enhance his profile, to become more famous. And he had wanted to go to Yellowstone. And in fact, on a, on a expedition 10 years before had tried to get there but they'd been snowed out because um, they had no transportation there they came they got there too late so he'd always had his eye on Yellowstone but then he got really worried because he thought Nathaniel Lankford might just you know he got there first then all these civilians were me coming in um, all these amateurs and they were going to ruin Yellowstone in the way that people had ruined Niagara so he was very worried about that, plus he wanted to kind of make his name in Yellowstone, and so he immediately went to work lobbying Congress. Um, he had had plans to go and lead a survey um, in the Rocky Mountains somewhere, probably Colorado, and then he changed his plans and he said, I'm going to go to Yellowstone. And he convinced Congress because they gave him $40,000 in March of 1871 to lead a survey. And puts together this big, huge, large survey, right? To, to, yeah. to travel in. They travel by train. Mm -hmm. as, you, as you've talked before, the Transcontinental Railroad is essential to that. Uh, Utah is essential to that mm -hmm. as a supply depot. And they head up and discover these amazing things, right? Prove the legends mm -hmm. to be true, if you will, and have the, the documentation to prove it. Yes, because what they had along on, on their survey were not only a lot of scientists, which the previous kind of civilian explorations had not had, um, but they also had a, a photographer of note, William Henry Jackson, and they had a painter named Thomas Moran, and they had an illustrator named Henry Elliott. And those three guys together produced the most complete visual record of Yellowstone um, that anyone had ever seen. And there hadn't even been, there had not been photographs before this point either. And so here was finally, especially with the photographs, proof, right? Because people, even though people knew even at that time that photographs could be manipulated, they were seen as evidence of true facts. So if there was a picture of Old Faithful, then that meant Old Faithful existed. Um, and so he had all of those guys along. He had a big group um, of 30 people uh, and then all of their support and their um, their second cavalry protection protection unit. And so there was about 50 people on the road. And he wrote back to Spencer Baird at the Smithsonian and, and said, you know, we're an impressive group, almost an army on the march. So they were this kind of propelling force uh, going into Yellowstone to kind of figure out what was there 
if the federal government could use Yellowstone for anything. And then he was super invested in Yellowstone because he wanted to answer some of the big geological questions of the day, kind of how old the earth was and how it came to look like it did. You know, what were the forces that were creating uh, the earth itself? Um, so he, was, he had a lot of different interests uh, in Yellowstone, uh, and he was quite successful. He led a very successful survey. They were in Yellowstone um, from kind of late June uh, into late August, uh, got out of there before the snows came, didn't lose a man, uh, despite uh, Hayden himself actually fell in to a mud volcano uh, in that area between <laughs> Yellowstone Lake um, and what is now the Hayden Valley, uh, and, uh, you know, managed to pull himself out, but not before uh, the mud volcano had burned his boots off his body. Nice. Yeah. So uh, as we head into our first break, the, the structure of your book is essentially Jay Cook, these st parallel stories of Jay Cook and Ferdinand Hayden. And uh, as you said, he leads in to a place that people assumed was uninhabited, mm -hmm. but of course it was not. It was not. And as we come back, we'll talk about those uh, inhabitants. But as we, as we always do, we ask our guests to provide us with some songs that are relevant to them. So this break, we will have uh, a band, The Head and the Heart, mm -hmm. with a song called Virginia Wind in the Night. And why did you choose this song? Uh, this is one of those songs when I first heard it on the radio, I, it was just immediately compelling. It was not a song you had to kind of grow to like. I, I loved it from the very beginning. And it's really about um, home and coming home and what different places mean to you. Cool. Virginia don't sound like she used to Walking all night Smoking my lungs and whiskey burning In my veins December won't be so forgiving I'm on it by Past colliding, I can never go home. When in the night, when in the night, thought that I heard you laughing, or wasn't that true, my darling? That I used to love well It's just another town
That was Virginia Wind in the Night by The Head and the Heart. Welcome back in everyone to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. I'm joined in the studio by Professor and Director of Apex Events, Ryan Paul, and our phenomenal guest speaker for the week, Megan Kate Nielsen. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Amelia. So we left off with this, this collision really of ideas and of cultures. And I want to go into the, the indigenous people that are living in this area. And, and you tell a great story about Hayden writing this thing about we're, we're the only ones here. And then let's, yeah. <laughs> right. So, yes. Yeah. So indigenous peoples had been using Yellowstone in a number of ways for thousands of years, right? They had been using it as a thoroughfare, as a ceremonial site, as a place to hunt, elk and deer and bison, especially in the winter, uh, because they were drawn to those grounds because they were so much warmer. Um, You know, there were only like one or two bands that were really living up in the mountains really consistently, um, including one Shoshone band. But for the most part, it was a shared space. It was a shared indigenous landscape. So no one tribal nation was laying claim to Yellowstone. It kind of belonged as a, as a more common space uh, for everyone. Um, and this, of course, led white Americans to believe that no Native people live there. But Hayden, <laughs> he would write in his reports, you know, as they, um, for example, went to go investigate what they called the White Mountain and what is now Mammoth Hot Springs. And he would say, I can't believe we're the first people to see this. This is awe-inspiring. This is amazing. And then I turned my horse up the trail and followed it up to the top of the structure. (laughs) And I'm like, Hayden, who built that trail, do you think? Like, what? Um, Obviously, uh, there were people here before you. Uh, And in fact, there were indigenous people there before him and... Hayden and his entire team had run into a whole group of former miners uh, along the Gardner River taking the waters for their illnesses when they first got there. So, you know, they weren't even the first white people to be there and to see this place. Uh, But Hayden, of course, believed uh, that he was the only legitimate person, that he was the first person to really encounter that space who knew what it meant fully because he was a scientist. So that leads us into the third protagonist in, in your book, which is Sitting Bull. And this is the, the Sitting Bull who is not the Sitting Bull of Little Bighorn yet, not yet. but is kind of coming into his own. Let's, let's talk about where Sitting Bull is when we're, mm-hmm. when we're introduced to him. Yeah, so I think most people wouldn't uh, associate with Sitting Bull um, with the Yellowstone in this time period because he was living his sort of the area that the Hunkpapa Lakota uh, were living in and hunting in was further east but they lived along the Yellowstone River Valley and Sitting Bull and all of his people believed that their homeland stretched from the Missouri River along the Yellowstone River watershed all the way to uh, its source which was the Yellowstone Basin and So they considered that their territory, and they very frequently ranged along it. They were um, always uh, bringing uh, war to the Crow Nation, which by this point had reservation lands uh, north of Yellowstone. Uh, But the Lakota were very interested in pushing the Crow beyond the mountains and taking that territory for themselves because it was such an amazing trading thoroughfare. They wanted control of it, right? So, um, So Sitting Bull... Uh, We don't really have any evidence that he knew that Hayden was in Yellowstone. Um, The people he was really paying attention to were the railroad surveyors that Jay Cook had sent. Um, They were trying to figure out where to lay down the track, again, between the Missouri and the Yellowstone Basin. uh, And they were moving right through the middle of Lakota homelands. And so Sitting Bull emerged in this moment defending his homelands and really fighting off these surveyors in three different engagements in 1871 and 72. And he, at this moment, really starts to come to the attention of U.S. Army officials um, and government officials because of those actions. And I, I think it's interesting that you, you spend a lot of effort in, in the book creating not only visual images, but using actually the Native American names and terms mm-hmm. and spellings. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, I, you know, I feel like as a non-Native person writing Native history, um, I, I always try to privilege 
um, native sources. So any source that is written by an indigenous historian, oral historian, any memoir, um, those sources I always use first. And I always privilege in the footnotes and in the, the accounts that I'm giving. Um, and then other sources written by white Americans, if they're primary documents or secondary sources, kind of come in at the end. So, um, so that's one strategy. The other strategy is to be very respectful of the language. Um, and there were certain terms uh, that I was, was using over and over again um, that were terms that the Lakota people used for, like, the Missouri River. And so those stayed in the Lakota language um, throughout the text. Um, and I always use the, the spellings um, for Hunkpapa Lakota um, especially as well. And for other terms, I just wanted to give uh, people a sense of what the Lakota term was, either for a person's name or the name of a location, uh, just that, so that there was a recognition there uh, that these are people who had a long history with this landscape, and they also called it by different names. And where did you, I mean, where do you find all that stuff? Is there like a Lakota spelling source yes. or online translator or, or what? Yes, there is a, there's a, well, there are a couple of different sources, but I used um, an online Lakota dictionary to do my translations. And then I also hired uh, a Lakota Dakota historian um, named Jimmy Sweet, who teaches at Rutgers. And I hired him to read my entire manuscript. And then I also hired him for a language consultation. Very cool. Very cool. So there's a great story, at least I think it's an amazing story, that we don't really know or tell about Sitting Bull mm -hmm. at, uh, at a, the Battle of Arrow Creek. Against mm -hmm. we, we relate that story because I think it's absolutely yeah. incredible. The, this is uh, one of those moments where Sitting Bull just kind of didn't set out to have a battle with U.S. Army officials. Um, it happened a little bit accidentally, but he and his uh, warriors were off, actually. They were, they were going to the Crow Reservation uh, to engage in battle there because the Crow were their traditional enemies. And so uh, they were on their way there, and they quite literally ran into a, the survey team, uh, one of the survey teams that Jay Cook had sent out from Fort Ellis in Bozeman. Um, so that team was coming from the west and moving east. They were coming from Yellowstone along the Yellowstone River, um, trying to survey a good place for to lay down the track. And so, you know, the Lakota warriors saw that they were there. They surveilled them for a day or two. And then Sitting Bull and his fellow leaders were kind of in consultation, deciding what to do. And then a group of their young men just decided that they were going to take this chance uh, to make their mark in warfare and uh, just headed, headed out, swam across the Yellowstone River and attacked uh, the, the surveyor's camp, which had a lot of uh, U.S. Army um, officers and soldiers with them to protect them. And so they began the Battle of Arrow Creek, um, and that was a battle that lasted most of the day. Uh, ultimately, both groups ended up on the same side of the river, and Sitting Bull and his men ended up kind of on a bluff. And they were trading shots back and forth. And it's an interesting moment because Sitting Bull is getting older. He's obviously a revered leader. But he's getting a little pushback from uh, younger uh, warriors uh, in the Hunk Papa band. He was also uh, facing some, some pushback from uh, this guy named Long Holy, who w had been convincing the younger men to kind of take action, uh, take more radical action than Sitting Bull was comfortable with. And Sitting Bull really saw that the battle was pretty much over. No one was going to win. No one was going to take that ground. Uh, but the but the, the Lakota had made their point and had said, this is our land. Uh, you are not supposed to be here. And so he called for a retreat. And Long Holy ignored him. Um, and some of the younger warriors ignored him. And Long Holy basically said to him, I don't know, have you lost your nerve? Have you lost your, you know, bravery? I thought you were a brave man. And this, of course made Sitting Bull quite angry. And so he got off his horse and he walked down the side of the bluff a little ways, about halfway, and then he just sat down in full view of the U.S. soldiers, who of course started shooting at him immediately. He took out his pipe, he like packed it with tobacco, and he started smoking it. And he kind of dared a couple of the younger warriors to come with him, and they did. And they sat there terrified and he passed the pipe to them and they all smoked it and they're kind of looking at him like how long are we going to sit here <laughs> under fire um and very calmly deliberately sitting bull just kind of 
you know, emptied out his, his pipe and cleaned it out and put it in his pouch and then gave them the signal, okay, time to go. And they just bolted and ran back up to the top of the, the bluff. And Sitting Bull just walked back up, cool as a cucumber. Uh, and he got back to his horse and then he said, let's go, we're gonna retreat. And that time they followed him. Um, Cause you know, they had never seen anything so courageous in their lives. That's an incredible story. Let's move to our, our next break. We have to take it. And this song that we're going at, we're going with is uh, Daisy the Great, the record player song. So can you tell us about that? Yes. This is another song that I immediately loved uh, when I heard it come on the radio. Uh, you'll be singing along to it as well uh, within a few bars. Um, but this is really about, uh, I think, girlhood and about taking risks um, and about you know, what that means um, for a woman's power in the world. So pretty much uh, things that I know nothing about. Exactly. Right. I've got a record player that was made in 2014. Dyed my hair blue. It came out of seasick sort of green. I like vintage dresses when they fall just below my knees. I pretend I scraped them. Climbing in the trees. Sometimes I think all I'm ever doing is trying to convince myself I'm alive. Sometimes I think. Was made in 2014, dyed my hair blue. It came out of seasick, sort of green. I like vintage dresses when they fall just below my knees. I pretend I scraped them climbing in the trees. back with us for the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. We're in the studio with director of Apex, Ryan Paul, and our speaker for this week, Megan Kate Nelson. I'll turn it back over to y'all. Thank you. So one of the things that I find interesting about history is how seemingly, as we can look back from the big picture, right, little events end up causing massive ripples. So somehow the little pebble in the pond ends up causing the tidal wave. And, and this is what happens for Sitting Bull, right? Sitting Bull, uh, you know, inadvertently causes the entire disruption of the American economy. Yeah, this was something that really surprised me when I started to do the research. 
you know, I'd known that Sitting Bull had had engaged in all of these actions against the Northern Pacific, but I thought, oh, he's just, you know, ruining Jay Cook's plans to make a bundle and and feel good about himself. And and then I realized, you know, because he was causing so much trouble, Jay Cook was not able to lay down his track, which meant that he couldn't get government money. He was not successful raising money um, to fund the construction of the railroad. And so he began to lend the Northern Pacific Railroad money from his own investment bank, which, by the way, if any of you out there are business majors going into this field, the worst possible idea you could ever have. Um, By the time it was all over, he had loaned the Northern Pacific $2 million. Uh, That was not his money. It was his investors' money. And when they came calling for it in September of 1873, he didn't have any money to give them. So Jay Cook & Company closed its doors uh, in New York and then Philadelphia and D.C. and really was one of the instigators launching the nation into the panic and depression of 1873. So yeah, so here's this moment where, you know, Sitting Bull is asserting the sovereignty of his people, and he ends up destroying a project that takes the country into financial chaos. I mean, railroads, like a a number of railroads actually never recover, massive Mm -hmm. railroad strikes, violence, layoffs across the country. Yeah, you know, this is a time of of just enormous railroad building and the emergence of all of these uh, railroad barons and like huge fortunes to be made on railroads if you could finance them and if they were successful. But many of these projects went by the wayside. Many of them failed. Um, A couple had already failed kind of in advance of Jay Cook and Company's closure, but then a lot of them failed afterward. Um, So you'd come across these railroad tracks that just sort of stopped in the middle of nowhere because no one had finished uh, the spur line or the track. But once the economy recovered, then there was more railroad building. And by 1883, which is when uh, the Northern Pacific was finally uh, completed, although Jay Cook had nothing to do with it because he had gone bankrupt and was just kind of living with his family and trying to get over his failure. Um, By that time, there were multiple railroads connecting the East and the West. And the country really was connected by rail and by telegraph across the country. And Jay Cook eventually recovers somewhat financially, like he makes one mm-hmm. wise investment. He does in a silver mine uh, and makes in, in a Utah, million. Right? I think in Utah, yeah. And he made a million dollars. Uh, and managed to buy back his cherished summer home um, on the on Lake Erie, named Gibraltar. Um, so he was able um, to do that, but he was never able to buy back his house or uh, any of the paintings that Thomas Moran had done for him. Um, he had to sell those off at auction uh, to pay his debts. So we we know kind of what happens to Sitting Bull, right, in, in the Sioux mm-hmm. with. Little Bighorn and his his end, as you talk about in in your book, what's kind of the legacy then of of I mean, maybe we could talk briefly about what happens to Hayden in the later years and mm-hmm. and what is the legacy of this particular survey? I mean, you talk the title of the book is Saving Yellowstone. My question is, for whom and mm-hmm. for what and what did they save? Right. So Hayden's survey was quite successful, and his lobbying effort was quite successful. Um, in that they did convince congressmen to pass the Yellowstone Act in uh, February, January and February of, of 1872, and that created the first national park in the world, right? So this is an amazing precedent. Congress didn't do much after that um, to kind of take advantage. There was no kind of swell of environmentalism uh, bringing new national parks uh, on the scene, but it was the precedent. So this this is another one of those actions. I mean, if you even want to take it back to Truman Everts, The fact that he gets lost creates all of these ripple effects that lead Hayden into Yellowstone. He does this project. He lobbies. We now have the Yellowstone Act and national parks become a reality. Um, And so Hayden kept uh, on, on the sort of force and power of that success ended up getting more and more appropriations from Congress. He led a couple more surveys into Yellowstone. Then he went to Colorado. Um, By 1876, he was trying to become the head of the uh, USGS, but was passed over, mostly because Hayden was the kind of guy you either loved him or you hated him. And the people in power determining who was going to lead the USGS hated him. So 
he did not get that job uh, and also kind of fell in decline for reasons I will not uh, divulge if you want to know uh, why uh, Hayden <laughs> kind of took a bad health turn. Uh, you'll need to read the book. But um, yeah, so he ends up, um, you know, still lauded for his achievements, but sort of fading from the scene a little bit. Um, and of course, Jay Cook resurrects himself. But I think it's really interesting that of the three of them, Sitting Bull is the one who is most well known uh, in our American history, not for his acts. Uh, kind of defending Yellowstone or trying to save it for his own people, um, but because of those actions that 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 you know those encounters led to later. So the idea of saving Yellowstone changes over time based on who is telling the narrative. Absolutely, yes. Very cool. Let's take one more break, and this is a song called uh, "Missing Peace" by Vance Joy. Do you want to share yes. with us? So this is a pandemic song. So uh, this is about uh, what happens when you're separated from your loved ones during something like COVID, and then you finally are able to travel again and see each other again. I've been waiting for the tides to change, for the waves to send you my way. I see you, darling, but you pixelate. It gets hard to take these days But we'll hold the line I won't let go Cause I'll be there where you can finally make it home And I don't mind Cause we both know That we'll be fine when you can finally make it home Because when I
Alrighty, everybody, welcome back in. That was Missing Peace by Vance Joy. You're here with us for the Apex Hour, joined in the studio with our speaker for the week, Megan Kate Nelson, and of course, our host, Ryan Paul. Ryan, back over to you. Thank you. As we're, we're nearing the end, but I'd like to ask you, know, I'd like to ask you a question about kind of what's what's next. What are you working on next now? I am working on my new book project, which is called The Westerners, uh, the true pioneers who built a region um, and shaped a nation. And the book basically asks the question, you know, what if we think about the people who built the West not as pioneers, but as Westerners? You know, not necessarily as kind of white people moving from east to west, but people from all different communities moving in all different directions through the West between 1800 and 1893. When are we expecting that to hit the shelves? 2025, fall, October. Yes. Very cool. Very specific yes. and very cool. It is, yeah. When you <clears throat> when you sign these contracts, you basically agree to turn – Turn a manuscript in, and, and it includes a publishing date. You can always shift it around, but it's good to make the deadline. Yeah, smart, smart, and hopefully won't have a little more a pandemic in between because you wrote you Saving Yellowstone during a pandemic, right? I did, and actually the previous book, Three Cornered War, came out a month before the pandemic started. So, yes, I would like to release a book in a sort of more <laughs> normal time without a lot of national and global trauma involved in it. That would be, that would be nice. Would we would nice. appreciate that as well. Yes. <laughs> so the time has come when we ask a final question, and we should say we are joined, uh, of course, as you all know, by my amazing and brilliant producer, Amelia Nauman. But we're also joined with our incredible intern, Sophie Javage, for this last segment. And this is a question, Megan, that we mm -hmm. ask everybody because yes. we just want to know. So, Megan Kate Nelson. Yes. What are you currently watching, reading, or listening to that is bringing you joy? The Great British Bake Off. <gasps> yes. Because I got to tell you, I was so happy when I discovered that show had dropped its first episode again uh, for this season. Um, that show just makes me so happy. The bakers are so lovely. They're so nice to each other. They're so supportive. And it's a show about food and delicious food. And it's just a lovely experience. I'm always happier when I'm done watching it. So are you going back to earlier seasons and coming up, or do you start? Oh, no. I've watched it all. So this is – I am currently in the new season. The next episode, I believe, drops Friday. So, yeah, I will be streaming that on Netflix. Have you baked anything that is – Oh, no. I have not. Um, I've, I've not done any of that experimentation, but I just, as far as reality shows go, it is just such a lovely viewing experience. Because even when people lose and they have to leave, yeah, I mean, I've, I, I may have cried more in Great British Bake Off episodes than any other show I've ever watched. Wow. Because they're just, they're so sweet. <laughs> they're so nice. And I also realize why it is almost impossible to do an American version of that show. Because we're just not so nice. There's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of snark, uh, I think, uh, among Americans, and the the way that they have with each other in the in the baking tent is just lovely. Very nice, very nice. Thank you, Sophie Javage. Yes, Ryan. What are you currently watching, listening to, or reading that is bringing you joy? I guess mine kind of falls under the listening category. I've had so many random people give me phone calls this week that have just brought me so much joy, like so many reconnections, people I haven't talked to in like years. All of my family members called me this week and they never do that all in one week and they were just all making me laugh and just bringing me so much joy. So I'd probably say random phone calls. Hmm. I she, love that. She could be on the Great British. <laughs> she could be the one she American could. that- She uh, could, and all I of her friends. does it. I'll, hey. I'm, I'm trying, in training. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Amelia Nauman, what are you currently watching, reading, or listening to that is bringing you joy? So this week, with every other college student in town, I went and saw Don't Worry Darling because of all the controversy around it. So I've been thoroughly enjoying reading all those Twitter threads and seeing the movie was a part of that. So there's my answer. 
All right, Ryan, we're going to turn this question over to you. What have you been listening to, watching, reading that is bringing you joy? I have had a chance to be in the car a little bit, and I have discovered a podcast, which I have really dug into, which is called History That Doesn't Suck. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's really an irreverent kind of cool look at American history, bringing connections together. And the episode that I really enjoyed was on the beginning of the Gilded Age, which is this period between the horrors of the Civil War and Reconstruction and the, the modern progressive Teddy Roosevelt. And uh, it, it, this episode talked about the railroad strike of Jay mm-hmm. Cook, which I found mm-hmm. fascinating. And uh, these three presidents who we don't hear much about, Hayes and Garfield and Fillmore, including mm-hmm. the untimely assassination of James Garfield, mm-hmm. who for all intents and purposes seemed like a real straight up dude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He and Hayes, actually. Yeah. What would the world have been like if Garfield would not have been killed? And, and mm-hmm. Guteau shoots him as, an, yeah. as a service to the Republican Party, right? That's like right. he's a Republican himself. So <laughs> anyway, that is what I find. Not that I find assassinations yeah. <laughs> joyful. Assassinations bring Ryan joy. People, this is what people we have who learned. tell good stories are, are wonderful and exciting. The very last thing we need to ask, because this begs the question, is uh, your cocktail. Your cocktail enthusiasts. <gasps> very quickly, oh. very quickly, give us your favorite. Okay, I'm gonna, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to give you three different ones that are, that are all the, the... I like cocktails where it has a couple of ingredients and then you can switch out the alcohol component. Um, so with bourbon, this drink is called the Gold Rush and it is bourbon and honey syrup and lemon. But you can put tequila in it and it becomes El Oro. Or you can put gin in it and it becomes the bee's knees. Mm. And it is quite nice. Highly recommended. Very nice. Five stars. Five stars. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, for coming to Cedar and to being here at the university. We've enjoyed our conversation. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us every Thursday at 3 p.m. right here on Thunder 91. We would love for you to come to our events on campus. For more information, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next time, that was the Apex Hour on Thunder 91.1.